So COVID passports and the Prime Minister's winter plan uh, are probably what's going to shape the week at this point. Uh, let's have a look at some of this morning's headlines. In any case, Lettis Bromovsky is a political commentator and contributor to Young Voices UK. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us nice and early. Right, let us start with COVID passports, shall we? Which uh, yes. seemed to be taken off the table by the Health Secretary yesterday, uh, but actually seemed to be very firmly part of the potential plan to push back against uh, a winter wave of, of COVID infections. Um, it's the issue that won't go away, isn't it, in terms of trying to deal with the pandemic, COVID passports? Yeah, no, definitely. I must say that myself, I'm completely um, opposed to them, really. Um, I think they're definitely a clear infringement on these civil liberties um, and denying the unvaccinated access to venues and travel um, will only lead to a sort of social apartheid. Um, But even more importantly, um, there's a significant lack of medical evidence to support them. Um, First and foremost, you know, those who are vaccinated still have a chance of catching the virus. So one in 13 chance of catching it if you are unvaccinated and one in 26 chance if you're vaccinated. So although there is this um, reduced chance of you, it does reduce your chances, sorry, we can't be giving people a false sense of assurance that they're protected or necessarily safe at these events. Mm. Are you vaccinated? Um, I am vaccinated, yes, okay. and I do believe in vaccines. Yeah, sure, no, absolutely, and that is a very important distinction, and I totally get that. But why yeah. is it that you don't feel that you would like the idea of, of reassurance, I suppose, of going into an event and knowing that the people around you are also vaccinated? Well, mainly because it was what I said, that even if you are vaccinated, it doesn't mean that you can't um, spread the virus itself. So although it may be slowed down, it sort of, it doesn't necessarily rule out that those who are vaccinated will catch it and spread it as well. Mm. Is there not a kind of social responsibility issue here, actually? And it's it's up to us to look out for one another. And the evidence suggests that uh, vaccines uh, do slow down transmissibility uh, and certainly um, can stave off the worst effects of COVID-19. That's why the death rate has come down, despite relatively high numbers of infections. Isn't there a responsibility on all of us here? And actually something like COVID passport could be could be the nudge mm-hmm. that people who are kind of a bit more hesitant, reluctant, or just frankly lazy about getting uh, vaccines, this could be the nudge in the, in the direction that they need. I mean, that's definitely could be the case. But I think, um, as you said, the focus should be on getting the vaccines rather than having a piece of document which could also easily be forged or something like that that says you're vaccinated. So obviously, um, 89% of our population has now received the first dose of their vaccine. We are one of the highest um, in Europe, you know, we're leading the way, one of the highest in the world, sorry. Um, And that should be the focus, getting more people vaccinated. But there shouldn't be this level of coercion that if you are not vaccinated, you are suddenly unable to go about and do normal daily activities. Mm. Uh, An interesting note on this uh, that I I spotted over the weekend from the US, that Delta, the airline, Delta's chief health officer says the airline's imposition of a $200 monthly surcharge on unvaccinated employees led 4,000 out of an estimated 20,000 who hadn't been vaccinated to go and get vaccinated, Um, which is just interesting in terms of how incentives work. Clearly, that's a cash incentive rather than a COVID passport. But I just wonder what what you kind of make of that, that actually that that, that tipped 4,000 people to go and get vaccinated out of uh, 20,000 who hadn't. Yeah, no, that, that definitely does. But again, I think this level of coercion and sort of, you know, money incentives or cutting people off from society in sort of those other ways, I don't think that's a way that we want to lead our society. I don't think that's a way we should govern our people. Um, I think it should be much more based on a society of choice, democracy, you know. Mm. Uh, Just on the COVID note then, let's go on to what is the uh, front page story of The Telegraph this morning. Uh, We have to learn to live with the virus, says the Prime Minister, as he insists he is dead set against further lockdowns. Uh, So we're looking ahead, let us, to tomorrow and Boris Johnson making clear Uh, that another national lockdown is not on the cards. He's going to rip up, uh, reports The Telegraph, going to rip up the old system of COVID rules and adopt a new approach for winter. Um, There's a suggestion here that, that, um, that mask mandates may come back, that working from home guidance may come back, should it be needed. I just wonder, is it going to be sort of lockdown light? Is that how it's going to feel to all of us, do you think, in terms of how we deal with COVID this winter? 
Um, I feel like there will always be a sort of threat of, like you say, lockdown light. Um, but I think that this scrapping of some of the most draconian measures um, from the early COVID days is so important for us beginning to learn with, um, learn to live with the virus um, and moving forward. Mm. So by getting rid of these measures, such as the ability to close down the economy, to detain infectious people, um, the ability to close schools, um, I think this is a really important step in the right direction of the government giving up the powers that they had, um, the very strict powers that they had over the public. It's really interesting. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because... I suppose, depending who you ask, learning to live with COVID will mean different things. Uh, You know, if you ask some scientists, some doctors, for example, then actually they would suggest that it is about we should be wearing masks and, uh, you know, we should maintain social distancing and perhaps vaccine passports should be a thing. But actually everyone's interpretation of that is going to be different. I just wonder politically how the Prime Minister, how hard he's going to have to work here to get everyone on board with his vision of what living with COVID actually looks like. Yes, and this will definitely be a struggle, particularly as we go into winter and there are all these fears that um, the virus will once again spike and we will see a spike in COVID. Um, But this was always going to happen. Winter is a time when people regularly get ill, not only from COVID, but from other flus and other viruses that are out there. Mm. Um, And this is something that he will have to work for. But I believe that the scrapping of these COVID measures will be much more popular within his Conservative government. Yes, and that's an interesting calculation, isn't it? So so a lot of the kind of comment on this suggests that it's because he's just had a bit of a battle over national insurance and, and the health and social care levy um, against his backbenchers. And actually, it's about the Prime Minister picking his battles um, at the moment. To what extent is that a valid reason for him to be making policy that affects all of us, that actually he's trying to appease some backbenchers? Yeah, no, um, it is, uh, it's definitely a valid reason. The national insurance um, rise um, was largely unpopular and kept a lot of people um, in line with the threat of uh, a government reshuffle that has not yet materialised. Um, but no, I think it's, it is important that, um, that he sort of has to appease where necessary and then um, enforce in other times. Mm. Uh, let's go on to uh, one final story just to mention. This is from The Guardian this morning, uh, just quite uh, notable. Uh, tens of thousands of working parents say the government is failing them with inadequate childcare policies that leave them financially crippled, stymied in their careers and desperate for radical change. This is according to a major survey of more than 20,000 working parents that's been shared with The Guardian. Uh, they, some, um, excuse me, One third of parents say they pay more for childcare than their rent or mortgage. I just wonder, my brain immediately less has went from social care last week, childcare this week. And I just wonder if this is another area where government intervention is going to be sought after. Um, I think definitely. Um, this this survey that um, is in the garden, it comes um, after a debate on childcare in Parliament that happened on Monday um, that was triggered by 100,000 parents who signed a petition calling for an independent review of childcare funding um, and affordability. So this clearly is an issue that is within the system. Um, and although, you know, I personally have never had to pay for childcare, the data here isn't lying. Um, the UK is the third most expensive childcare system in the world. Um, and then there was recent research by the Trade Union Congress that found that between 2008 and 2016, the cost of one, a one-year-old's child nursery provisions grew four times faster than wages in England. Um, and in London specifically, it was seven times faster. So there clearly is an area that needs to be reformed here um, and an issue that's growing. Really interesting speaking to you this morning. Thank you so much, Lettuce. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Nice one. That's uh, Lettuce Bromofsky, political commentator and contributor to Young Voices UK.